Welcome to God and Country Biblical Exposition. A recent Gallup poll showed that 51% of millennial Americans ages 18 to 29 said that they were positive about socialism. Among the general population, 76% said that they would not vote for a socialistic political candidate, but 24% said that they would. Well, that sounds good for the prospects of economic freedom, but that's still one out of every four people who will vote for socialism, however they define it. Now, according to a number of articles, uh, the Democratic Party has 42 candidates running as Democratic Socialists. This is a new thing, announcing that you're not just a Democrat, but that you are a Democratic Socialist like Bernie Sanders. Uh, this summer, Maine's Democratic Senate candidate, Zach Ringelstein, announced that he was a socialist. Uh, Cynthia Nixon, running for governor of New York, announced that she was a socialist. She said, yes, some more establishment corporate Democrats get very scared by this term. But if Democrat socialism means that you believe health care, housing, education, and the things we need to thrive should be a basic basic right, not a privilege, then count me in. Notice she said things we need to thrive, not things we need to survive. This is not about a social safety net. She wants total collectivism. And of course, there is Alexandria Cortez running for the congressional seat in New York, who is also a young socialist. Uh, leaders in the Democratic Party are trying to downplay the socialist movement in the party. Nancy Pelosi said that she doesn't believe socialism is spreading in the ranks and she doesn't accept the Republicans' characterization of Democrats as being socialists. And the reason for this pushback is that poll that 76% of the population would not vote for a socialist candidate. So even Hillary Clinton in her campaign said that she wasn't a socialist. Democrats do not want the socialist label because it still carries negative baggage. But a rose by any other name is still a rose. And although certain politicians will deny being socialists, the majority of those on the political left hold to the ideology of socialism, collectivism. Labels will change overnight. It's the ideology we should identify and define. And that's what I'd like to address in this week's program. What is socialism? Is it a biblical or an unbiblical economic system for a nation? Or rather, is it right or wrong? Is it justice or injustice? And this is a really a big subject. It's probably going to take a three-part series to, uh, to cover this topic. Uh, the first part today, I want to mainly talk about the importance of this particular issue. Because so many people, even in the church, will say, what difference does this make? And is this really something for the church to address? You know, out of all of the negative email that I get, and I don't get much, I would say that the biggest complaint I get is from people in the church saying that the church should have nothing to do with politics that this is not ministry. And I believe that view can very easily be refuted. In August of this year, World Magazine had an article about the border crisis between Venezuela and Colombia. One million people have escaped from Venezuela to take refuge in Colombia. Why? Well, the politicians in Venezuela recently turned Venezuela into a socialist state. Venezuela used to be one of the richest countries in South America. Now the grocery stores are empty. There's no work. The average Venezuelan has lost 20 pounds. And inflation is at 32,000%. Yes, you heard me right. 32,000%. The government has recently issued new currency erasing five zeros off of the old currency. They did this to hide inflation. So if you had 
one million bovelars, you now only have a thousand. So the old adage is true. The problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. And Venezuela ran out of other people's money in just a few years. In their fantasy, they believed they could create wealth by just printing money out of thin air. Well, in this World Magazine article, it describes how pastors are working tirelessly to transport food and necessities across the border into Venezuela. Quote, Pastor Gomez has been willing to risk taking large packages in order to help more people. And so far, he says, God has given us grace for that. Well, that's great ministry. But the real problem is not a lack of food. The real problem here is economic injustice. People are quite capable of taking care of themselves. But whenever there is poverty and hunger, it is almost always due to the government stealing from people through poor economic policy. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 23. Abundant food is in the fallow ground of the poor, but it is swept away by injustice. So if you really want to be a social justice warrior, get rid of government collectivism. Unless Christian missionaries and pastors teach these people God's law concerning property rights and free enterprise, all of the charity in the world is not going to alleviate their hunger. And the best illustration of this is my old favorite, the sinking cruise ship. All of the Christians are working diligently on the top deck bailing out water coming into the boat. And yes, many of the passengers are ignoring the trouble and they're getting a tan on a lounge chair. But the Christians are sacrificing their time and their efforts. They're being charitable. They see how these incoming waters are hurting the people and so they start bailing it out. And they expend great time and great energy in doing this to save the nation. But all that effort could be dispensed with if someone would just go to the bottom of the boat and plug the hole. Plugging the hole would be much easier. And the hole that is drowning people is bad government, economic law and policy. Again, Proverbs 13, 23. Abundant food is in the fallow ground of the poor, but it is swept away by injustice. The world is filled with wealth. There's plenty of food and resources for everyone. And it's a lie that the economic pie is only so big. It's a lie that the other person who has a big piece of the economic pie is keeping me from getting a big piece of the pie. The fact is that the pie can expand by your work. If people are in poverty, the problem is government policy stealing people's property rights and hence keeping them from expanding their piece of the pie. In fact, in this cruise ship illustration, the guy who goes to the bottom of the boat to fix the hole may well say to those who are bailing out the water, you are wasting your time and your money. And of course, those who are bailing out the water are going to be quite offended because they're going to say, hey, we're doing charity work. You know, we're sending money to Haiti. We're helping these people build houses. We're giving these people food. But in a real sense, they can be wasting their time if they're not fixing the ungodly economic policy that's causing the problem. If they're only giving people a fish rather than teaching people how to fish or letting people be allowed to fish. All of the Western charity to Haiti, to Africa, to South America can actually be a waste of time in many instances. And that's why Christian missionaries need to work primarily on teaching biblical truth. The holy law of God and the gospel of salvation, that will fix the main spiritual problem and the ancillary poverty problem. Jesus knew what he's talking about when he gave the Great Commission, which is to teach truth, not to just do social work. Matthew 18, 19, 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. So what did Jesus teach? Well, he taught, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But he also taught, beware and be on guard against every form of greed. And evil economic policy is a form of greed. As Winston Churchill said about socialism, socialism is the philosophy of failure, the creed of ignorance, and the gospel of envy. So the job of the church is to teach biblical economic policy. It is not antithetical to the gospel. It is not a distraction from the gospel. We are to do good to all men, Galatians 6.14, and we're to engage in good works and we're to meet pressing needs. I'm currently reading a book by a Washington Post journalist entitled Out of America, A Black Man Confronts Africa, and the foreword reads the following. Nothing in Keith Richards' long and respected journalistic career at the Washington Post prepared him for what he would encounter as the paper's correspondent in Africa. He found a continent where brutal murders had become routine, where dictators and warlords silenced dissent with machine guns and machetes, and where starvation had become depressingly common. With a great deal of personal anguish, Richburg faced a difficult question. If this is Africa, what does it mean to be an African-American? So as I'm reading this book, I'm asking the question, what happened to Africa? We read all of these great missionary stories about David Livingston and Mary Schlesser and John Moffat, who evangelized Africa in the 19th century. And the Western Church has sent hundreds of thousands of missionaries into Africa over the past 150 years. One statistic states that there are now 43,000 Western missionaries in Africa today. So why is Africa still a hellhole? Those aren't my words. Those are the sentiments of this black journalist. Well, could it be? that those missionaries simply brought into Africa John 3.16. Whoever believes in him should not perish. But left off the rest of the teaching in the New Testament. Christian living. The Christian worldview. They never adorned the doctrine of Christ, as it says in Titus chapter 2. Now, I don't want to blame these missionaries because there are many other factors involved. But if a missionary does not disciple, whatever Christianity exists will not significantly change the culture. My church supports a pastor in Ghana, and his assessment is this, that the church in Africa is all about emotionalism and the prosperity gospel, and that's why Africa is a mess. It's not because Africa has Christianity. It's because Africa has a false Christianity. Why was Northern Europe so successful economically? Why were there clean streets and nice homes? Why were businesses and hospitals and educational institutions built? I mean, what made Northern Europe different? Was it something in the water? No, it was doctrine. It was a different theology the theology of the Reformation, the Christian work ethic, Christian belief in private property and individual accountability. God's word made it into the law and into the culture. And that's what made a difference. And again, the power of the church is God's truth, its worldview, its teaching. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The church that just gives out food and trinkets with no serious doctrinal teaching will only hurt the culture, not help. And it's actually a disobedience to the New Testament mandate. Paul instructs Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.11, prescribe and teach these things. 1 Timothy 4.13, until I come, give attention to public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. 1 Timothy 4.16, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. 
Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. So Paul's instruction to Timothy in Ephesus was to teach, teach, teach biblical doctrine and practice. And that includes biblical economics. Thou shall not steal is still one of the Ten Commandments. And another reason why we should teach biblical ethics is remember, the economic system of Marxism resulted in the death of 100 million people in the 20th century. All because bitter people thought that they had the right to the property and the labor of others. All because people thought that they deserved economic equality through collectivism rather than through personal responsibility and work. And it's no coincidence that the Marxism of the 20th century was tied at the hip to atheism. Because economics is a tangible way people show either their obedience or their disobedience to God. Jesus constantly made reference to the use and the abuse of money. So all this was by way of introduction concerning the importance of this subject. I mean, I haven't even begun to discuss the biblical injunctions against socialism. But given the pushback from some naive and untaught Christians, it's kind of necessary to explain that the Bible actually has something to say about economics and we need to speak up about it. So what is socialism? Part of the problem is misunderstanding and misdefining the term. So that when you talk to millennials about socialism, they think socialism is charity. And so when you say to them um, that you're biblically opposed to socialism, they think that you're saying you're biblically opposed to charity. But socialism is not primarily about charity. Capitalism and free enterprise are all about charity. So please remember to begin any discussion about socialism by making this distinction. Socialism is not about charity. Socialism is really about what we ought to be doing together. Charity is about giving to the poor. Socialism is about the government forcing everyone to do everything through the government. That only the government can fairly distribute the economic activities of everyone. So therefore, in socialism, we put all of our retirement money into one pot, and then the government hands out Social Security checks. We put all of the dollars that we would spend on K-12 through education into one pot, and then the government distributes, distributes those resources. Now, those on the socialist left also want to add college education to that which we do together. And single-payer health care is socialism saying that we need to do health care together. So... As an ideology, socialism means that education, health, retirement, savings, housing, jobs should be done together through the confiscation of the government. Hence, either the government should own all the businesses or at least regulate all businesses and take most profits. Socialism is communism. Socialism means working together as a society. Communism means working together as a community. It is the same thing. The way socialism and communism have been distinguished by some is that socialism is a lesser form of communism. But that's a fallacy because they both believe in collectivism. They both lead to the same conclusion. And since socialism is ideologically on the same foundation as communism, socialism is just a transitional path to communism. There are many mischaracterizations of socialism and communism. But I have found that the best definition and the best explanation to give people is in regard to what we should do together. All, nothing, or something in between. Uh, that's what the big argument is all about. And if we can nail down what we should be doing together 
then the socialism argument is settled. But people can't seem to figure out what we should or shouldn't do together. And that's why we have a fight between two parties. The one says the government should take and redistribute the wealth and the services. The other party says, no, that's the responsibility of the individual. And actually, both sides can operate on a type of greed that they mistake as charity. The socialist says, we should do everything together, maybe because he wants other people's money. The capitalist may say, hey, we should do everything apart, but he also might not want to share. And I'm willing to admit that about some capitalists. Now, there is a biblical standard concerning what we should and shouldn't do together, and I will get around to explaining that later in the series. But first, let me just talk about what's intrinsically wrong with socialism. On the surface, it sounds so altruistic. It sounds like you're sharing everything. After all, look at all the things we already do together. We build roads together. We work together for the military. So why not do everything else together? Education, childcare, food, clothing, cradle to grave government services. And this kind of collectivism might at first appear to be biblical. Acts chapter 2, verse 44. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began to sell their property and possessions, and they were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Acts chapter 4, verse 34. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sale and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each as any had need. By the way, this was during a time of persecution. Paul also wrote the following about the offering for poor saints in Jerusalem. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13. For this is not for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality. That at the present time, your abundance be in a supply for their need so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need, that there may be equality. And this reminds us of the popular slogan of Karl Marx, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. But the difference between socialism and biblical sharing is that socialism is forced redistribution by the government. The Bible speaks of charity by means of voluntary giving. The biblical example of sharing does not violate biblical property rights. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 21, You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. But in Micah chapter 2, verse 2, the wicked, they covet fields and they seize them. They take them by force. And houses and take them away. They rob a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. So who is seizing fields? Private businesses? No. All private businesses can do is trade with you. They don't have the power to steal your house unless the government gives them that power. Businesses that make cars and cell phones and furniture and food do you no harm. They are not, as they're often called by the socialists, those greedy businesses. Because in reality, they cannot steal a dime from you. It's only government that has the power to take from you by force. To either take it for themselves or to allow others to take it, crony capitalism, where the government forces you to buy a particular product. Poverty is caused by the misuse of the government's power of force, not by free enterprise business. Yet all of these socialists are crying for government force against these alleged greedy businesses, but these socialists have no idea what they're talking about because they've never been discipled. Let me conclude today's program with a great way to explain this whole issue through the biblical example of Boaz in the book of Ruth. Boaz was a farmer, and as it says in the Law of Moses, 
Boaz would let the poor glean the corners of his fields, and that's how Ruth met Boaz. Now, how come the poor didn't have farms of their own? I mean, there's plenty of land. All they had to do was to start farming. But there were women and children, like Ruth and Naomi, who didn't have fathers and husbands to support them. And so the law provided that charity be given to such people. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 19. When you reap your harvest in your field and have forgotten the sheave in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow, in order that the Lord your God may bless you in the work of your hands. So actually, it would not be unjust for the state to require businesses and individuals to take a percentage of their profits and give them to charity or to provide jobs for the poor, which is exactly what businesses do. People are unemployed, they're poor, and these businesses create jobs for them. But imagine if a group of bullies came along and said to Boaz, Boaz, you need to give your money to us and you need to give your farm to us because you didn't build that. And what we're going to do is do everything collectively as a society. We are going to take your produce and redistribute it. Oh, and by the way, we're not going to be farmers ourselves actually producing something. We are going to pay ourselves a comfortable salary to be redistributors of the works of your hands. And that's socialism. It comes in various degrees of collectivism. But the philosophy always leads to two classes in society, the bureaucratic ruling class and the working slave class. Socialism is medieval feudalism. The king owns the land and the peasants work the land. The lord of the land takes the profits and he redistributes it back to the peasants as he pleases along with taking a big cut for himself. And the lie of socialism is this, that in order for there to be economic justice and charity for the poor, it has to be done through government collectivism, through feudalism. For only the king has the right and the wisdom to justly distribute resources. And so our retirement money, our healthcare money, our education money has to be done through the king in order for the disadvantaged to be taken care of. But says who? The poor can be taken care of quite well through direct charity, government and private. But collectivism as a system really isn't about helping the poor because charity works just fine. It's about control and greed. Socialism is wrong, not simply because it doesn't work, but because it is unjust. Now let's do some commentary on the culture. Well, the big news of the week. After the Senate hearings for Supreme Court nominee Brent Kavanaugh were over, Senator uh, Diane Feinstein of California came forth with a woman accusing Kavanaugh of molesting her in a party back in 1982. Uh, she was 15, Kavanaugh was 17. The accuser, uh, Christine Blaisley, was offered an opportunity to testify before the committee on Monday, but now her lawyer says she will not testify until the FBI does an investigation. But the FBI has no crime to investigate beyond the statute of limitations. The accuser has not filed charges and there is no specific details concerning the time and the place to investigate. Juanita Broderick said that if the FBI investigates this case, it needs to also investigate her accusations against Bill Clinton, which it didn't do. The Democrats have said publicly to their base that they have planned to stop Kavanaugh's appointment at all costs. And so this is really a ploy to delay the Senate vote in his confirmation until after the November election when the Democrats think they will win back 
the Senate. And everybody knows this is a ploy. The whole thing is one big game and the politicians are acting as if this whole thing is legitimate. Psalm chapter 64. They hold fast to themselves an evil purpose. They talk of laying snares secretly. They say, who can see them? They devise injustice saying, we are ready with a well-conceived plot for the inward thoughts and the heart of man are deep. Well, the good news in all this is that although this energizes the base of the Democratic Party, it makes the Democrats really look foolish in the court of public opinion. And this will probably backfire on them among the general public. Remember, Psalm 915 is always true. In the net in which they hid, their own foot has been caught. Number two, Colin Kaepernick, we all know, has become the new face of Nike, not because he was such a great athlete, uh, but because he promoted the critical theory lie that America is a racist, unfair nation. And there are many things that could be said about this. But I believe the most telling is the hypocrisy in people like Kaepernick. Kaepernick, who is supposed to be all against oppression, is getting millions of dollars to promote a company that basically uses slave labor to produce its products. Here's an article. Kaepernick joins Nike to sell a company built on modern slavery. For at least 20 years, Nike has been criticized for its labor practices, including the offshoring of jobs to subcontractors who use child labor and who practice human trafficking or modern day slavery to help Nike turn a very handsome profit. And so this brings me back to a principle that I've repeated often. Be assured that liberal policies that profess to help people in the end will always hurt people. Jeremiah 23, 32. They lead my people astray with their falsehoods and reckless boasting. Yet I did not send them or command them, nor do they furnish this people the slightest benefit. So whenever you grow weak, and begin to think, well, maybe these people are helping a little, remind yourself of Jeremiah 23, 32. This truth, that they do not furnish this people the slightest benefit. Because when your ideology is a lie, you will be a destroyer, not a builder. Number three, I've been thinking a lot about the recent tweet put out by that priest, Philip DeVos, against the uh, Roman Catholic pedophile scandal. I mentioned uh, this tweet uh, a number of weeks ago in my YouTube on the topic, but let me read it again. Without the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office, the bishops would still be lying, obfuscating, and making asinine and entirely forgettable remarks about the economy and immigration, while ignoring corruption, abuse of power, criminal carnality, abortions procured by predatory priests, systematic homosexual predation, pedophilia, sexual harassment, and rape in their own ranks. And despite these revelations, they don't appear to be all that upset about it. What struck me about this tweet was his comments about the priests, the Catholic hierarchy, making public statements and judgments about the economy and immigration, which the Roman Catholic Church does often. But all the while, these social judges are engaged in personal, perverted, immoral behavior. And I thought to myself, this isn't just the priests. This is really the media, the politicians, the intellectual leaders in our country. They are making asinine and entirely forgettable remarks about the economy and immigration while ignoring corruption, abuse of power, criminal carnality, abortion, homosexuality, in their own ranks. Personal, immoral, corrupt people have no wisdom or authority to speak about social ills. In my church, we're doing a series on the book of Ezekiel. And God shows Ezekiel the idolatrous, immoral corruption that is going on behind closed doors in Jerusalem. 
And in Ezekiel 11, 2, God says to Ezekiel, Son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity and give evil advice to this city. The bottom line is this. Their politics is all messed up because they are personally depraved, immoral people. Don't forget that. That really explains the political landscape in our day. Number three, I have here a series of thoughts about the sexual deviance in our country, how it has taken over the culture politically. You know, revolutions in the past have been primarily about economic egalitarianism. The Jacobins in France, you know, the National Socialists in Germany, the Bolsheviks in Russia, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, the Fascist Revolution Party in Italy. Uh, it was all about economics. But now the leftist revolution is driven by sexual deviance. Now, other revolutions in the past contained that element. But today, it's more prominent in the rebellion. And so the revolution today is even more insidious. It is more rebellious against God's natural order. So a few stories in this regard. Maxine Waters, California congresswoman, in a speech said, I wake up in the middle of the night and all I can think about is I'm going to get Trump. I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. She repeated. And I'm in this fight and I'm not going to move. As you know, there is a difference in how some of our leadership talk about how we should handle all this. They say, Maxine, please don't say impeach anymore. And when they say that, I say impeach, 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 impeach. And she is loudly applauded by the crowd. But what is really telling is who she was addressing. She was receiving the Heroes Award from the Stonewall Democrats. This is a homosexual group of Democrats named after the Stonewall Inn where the homosexuals started their civil rights movement. Notice her supporters. Notice the political agenda of her constituency. This is Sodom. This is Psalm chapter 50. When you see a thief, you're pleased with him and you associate with adulterers immoral people. These are sodomites driving this political action. Another story, Denise McAllister, a writer for PJ Media, tweeted out, at the root of the hashtag abortion hysteria is woman's unhinged desire for irresponsible sex. Sex is their God. Abortion is their sacrament. It's abhorrent as women have flung themselves from the heights of being the world's civilizing force to the muck and the mire of dehumanizing depravity. That's great discernment on her part. The first sin in abortion, the driving cause of abortion, is widespread sexual immorality. McAllister has received death threats and rape threats because of this tweet. She says, uh, they are threats outside of Twitter stating that they know where I live. Threats of rape and strangling. I spoke to the police. I am on home watch. My children are frightened. So the same people who engage in immorality and infanticide will violently threaten people who say any truth about them. Here's another LGBT story. LGBT Antifa protesters protest in front of a church in Austin, Texas. Gay right activists chanted and waved um, pride flags and held signs last week to protest Celebration Church because of its opposition to gay marriage, demanding its members renounce their biblical views on sexuality while condemning the church's support of biblical marriage between one man, one woman. LGBT advocates are becoming certainly more vocal and heavy-handed against Christianity, and we are going to see this grow. A cultural civil war is on the horizon. Jeremiah 23, 14. Also among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen a horrible thing, the committing of adultery and walking in falsehood, and they strengthen the hands of evildoers. 
so that no one turns back from his wickedness. All of them have become to me like Sodom and her inhabitants like Gomorrah. So how do they strengthen the hands of evildoers? Well, here's one example. A study by Brown University found that young people are having gender dysphoria and coming out as gay, bisexual, transgender, not because it's innate, but they're being informed by their culture. They are imitating the LGBT ideology that they hear in schools and they read about in the social media. Brown University quickly took down the study because it was politically incorrect. Quote, Brown University is censoring findings from its own study on transgender youth, which found evidence that teens can be influenced by social media and their friends' circles to want to change their gender identity. Parents have been reporting that their children are experiencing what is described here as rapid gender dysphoria. Uh, the onset of gender dysphoria seems to occur in the context of belonging to a peer group where one multiple, or even all of the friends have become gender dysphoric and transgender identified during the same time frame. So basically, these confused children, these rebellious ch children, are, are jumping on the bandwagon claiming to be gay. This summer, a nine-year-old committed suicide after coming out being gay. The mother claims that he killed himself because he was bullied in school for coming out. That might simply mean someone questioned his decision. But why would a nine-year-old come out as being gay? Because the parent pushed this fourth grader into sexual gender identity issues. And what I find interesting is that when the immoral people of the world begin to have the inevitable psychological and emotional problems, who do they blame? Not their sin. They blame God and they blame Christian people for making them feel guilty. And this is at the core of man and Satan's rebellion against God. Not that there is intrinsic evil that we do to ourselves, but this is all God's fault for having rules. Finally, this hostility against God is summed up by Anne Hathaway in a speech she gave for receiving a National Ally for Equality Award from the very left-leaning human rights campaign. And in that speech, Hathaway basically called Christian morality a myth that keeps money and power in the hands of the few instead of being invested in the lives of the free. That is critical theory philosophy, that it's all about power, and morality is all about power. But what she said that was most alarming was this, let's tear this world apart and build a better one. And this is what the ungodly of our generation want to do. You can call it critical theory, you can call it leftism, you can call it atheistic communism, call it modernity or the spirit of this age, whatever. It is the great apostasy that the Apostle Paul spoke about that will come at the end of this age, bringing in the apocalypse. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy, the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Notice the title, Lawlessness. And there will be a vast outbreak against God and God's values, like the small sample we saw in the French Revolution. But this will be worldwide. So we are seeing the left kicking at the door, making headway. And the day will probably come that they will win. And they will probably cheat and lie to gain that popular support. They will take control. A new leftist administration will arise and they will not hold back. They will take control of the media, the, the internet, the power of government. And we sense that this is coming and this is prophesied. So what are we to do? Well, let's not hold back. We're to be the salt of the earth. 
We are to be the preserving power. We are to keep teaching truth, to never back down, regardless of their rage. There's nothing that offends the left more than the speaking of truth. Yet we do know that someday God will say to them, this hour and the power of darkness are yours. Then we will stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For God will reign on their party. So thank you for listening today. The contact information is on the closing slide. Don't forget to uh, hit the subscribe button to help the cause. Next week, we're going to continue in this series on socialism. Is it biblical or unbiblical? May God greatly bless you as you continue in his word. For blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. Oh,